all you wonderful hikers and backpackers, this is Somewhere Else here, also known as Fern Toe when I'm out on the trail. And recently I went on a winter backpack from the Pigeon River Bridge on the AT where the AT crosses the I-40 to Hot Springs. And I would like to do videos of my trips. And on that video I got a question about what kind of winter backpacking gear that I used in terms of what I hiked in during the day to keep me warm and also what I slept in at night. And I thought I'd use that as an opportunity to do my first gear video. I want to preface this video off by stating the obvious and that is what works for me may not work for you. Some people sweat more than others. Some people are cold sleepers versus warm sleepers. Some people have good circulation in their extremities and some don't. The only way to really find out what works for you is to get out there and experiment. Drive to a campground and set up your tent next to your car in a wide variety of temperatures and conditions and see what works for you. Uh, for me personally, I'm six feet tall, 200 pounds with a medium build. I like to consider myself good to above average cardiovascular shape. I sweat a small to medium amount. I have good circulation. I sleep a little bit on the colder side and I have no health conditions. I feel my gear is suited to my body and my preferences. So again, this gear may not work for you in your particular situation. Now on my last AT trip, we started at about 4 p.m. and temperatures were probably in the mid 30s to low 40s. And as the sun went down and the higher we climbed, it felt like the temps dropped down to mid to high 20s by the time we summited Snowbird Mountain after dark. We didn't have to deal with any kind of wind chill or high winds and the initial climb out of the Pigeon River bridge area was a beautifully still winter wonderland. And the cool thing about it was that as our elevation changed, what you got to see was a gradual change in accumulation from a light coating to areas that looked like a frosted or powdered donut. It was gorgeous and the conditions were ideal for hiking in the snow. It was about one to two inches of accumulation at the top of Snowbird Mountain with dirt patches here and there, so it wasn't that bad. And my friends had no issues in trail runners. Sleeping temps got down to 21 degrees on the first night and 23 on the second with no wind. With that being said, let's get to the winter gear. I will put all the links to all of the gear in the description below. During my last winter trip, I always had three top layers on at all times, and that was for the first and second day. The third day got up to 50 degrees, which allowed me to take two layers off, but the majority of the time, I'd say daytime hiking temperatures were between the high 20s and high 30s. I never hike in my puffy jacket, except in some rare circumstances, and it was never for more than a mile or two. Once you sweat up your puffy jacket, it's kind of useless in my opinion. For my base layer, I have two brands of shirts, Ascend and North Face. All shirts are long sleeve and made out of nearly 100% polyester. 100% polyester shirts are great for wicking sweat, and by the time we arrived at Groundhog Creek Shelter to camp after about eight miles of hiking, my base layer was only slightly damp. I never feel like I soak my polyester shirts all the way through to the point where I can wring them out with sweat. If you are having that issue, you may want to make some adjustments. My Ascend shirts are thicker and my North Face shirts are thinner. Some of them have hoods, which is nice for when you want to have a little bit of extra warmth around your head if you need it. I also took my thickest hooded Ascend shirt for this trip, which is the, the one I'm wearing now. And I've been wearing these kind of shirts for years and the colors haven't faded. The quality hasn't degraded and um, I wear the same shirts in the summer as well. I really think 100% polyester, no matter the brand, doesn't have to be Ascend, doesn't have to be North Face. It's the way to go for your base layer. In the summer, I've been caught in downpours with these shirts on and they dry incredibly quickly, especially when the sun comes out. I've been caught in downpours at the end of a hike as well and I've forgotten to bring a change of clothing. So I have to turn on the AC or the heat and within an hour while driving home, my shirt will be completely dry. And at the end of a day's hike or backpack at camp, the mild dampness that accumulates in my shirt 
pretty much dries out from my natural body heat um, with the other layers that I put on to sleep at night. Next up is my mid layer. It is a Patagonia Nano Puff vest and surprise, the shell, lining, and fill are all made out of 100% polyester, which is great for wicking moisture from my base layer. It's not thick, but it's very lightweight, compacts down well, and keeps my core warm enough. Like my base layers, it dries out quickly in front of a fire at night or from my natural body heat in my sleep layers throughout the night. I've never soaked it in my sweat, and at worst, it's mildly damp when I get to camp. I don't really have much else to say about this vest other than it works well for me. Next up is my outer shell. I changed things up from my last trip and wanted a lighter jacket. My old shell is heavy, doesn't pack well, and makes me sweat more. I decided to use my rain jacket as a substitute and it worked out pretty great. My rain jacket is a Montbell Versalite. It's very lightweight, compacts down well, is a great windbreaker, has pit zips, generous pockets, and tons of adjusters to cinch the hood, neck, and bottom of the jacket tight around your body. The wrists have adjustable Velcro to make a tighter fit around your gloves. And I did a lot of research on rain jackets and outer shells and found out a hidden secret about rain gear. It's not really designed to keep you from getting wet. It's designed to keep you warm. With rain gear, you'll either get wet from sweat on the inside or rain or snow from the outside. A lot of jackets will simply wet out on you after a while as the waterproof coating wears down or reaches a threshold where the water comes through anyway. I watched a review of a guy that reviews hiking gear called Grizzle Bear. He's a PCT through hiker and his review is what sold me on this jacket. I'll include his review in the description below. So there are my three top layers that I used 95% of the time on my last winter AT backpack. Now was I cold with three thin layers on? Yes and no. I think the sweet spot on a winter trip is to simply regulate your body temperature. You don't want to be so cold that you are shivering, but at the same time, you don't want to put on so many layers that you suffocate your body and allow all that sweat to soak all of your clothes. And then as soon as you stop, you freeze. A buddy of mine that came on this trip bailed at Max Patch because on day two, he was wet and cold and shivering the night before with no wind. He made the right call to bail. I bailed on my first winter trip, better safe than sorry. Additionally, I didn't even have an extra layer on as I went over max patch with 30 to 40 mile an hour winds, with wind chill making it feel like it was in the low 20s. My jacket was great as a windbreaker, and for the 20 minutes it took to climb and cross match packs, none of my extremities went numb. I didn't shiver. It's an odd sensation to describe, but the cold generally doesn't feel like it penetrates more than skin deep from the sweat evaporating from my body. So there you have it, my top three layers. Next, I'll say a quick note about gloves and hats before moving on to bottom and sleep layers. A quick note about gloves. Had I not left my glove liners in my car on my last AT trip, I would have used them almost exclusively. They are thin, sweat wicking, lightweight, you can ball them up and throw them in your pocket or in your pack, use your phone with the little fingertip pads that they have, and most importantly, they take the edge off the cold considerably. Are they warm? No, but they are just warm enough to stop your hands from going numb. If I got cold enough, I'd simply just slip on my fleece gloves over my liners like so for some extra warmth. Part of the problem with large or regular Gore-Tex gloves is that my hands sweat a lot in them, especially when working them with my trekking poles going uphill. Glove liners help with that sweat. They should be thought of as base layers for your hands. You layer your body and you can layer your hands as well. Those huge two inch Gore-Tex waterproof gloves that you see in stores weigh more, they take up more pack space and they dry slower once you get them all sweaty from the inside. Glove liners are sold in a variety of brands, and mine just happened to be REI Co-op. One last comment on upper layers that I'd like to make is about hats. Similar to my gloves, I really don't like big bulky hats. On my last AT trip, I accidentally left my thicker hat in the car as well as my glove liners, but I ended up being just fine because I had two buffs with me. One has a turtleneck on it, and the other one is just a regular thin buff 
and I had a very thin smart wool uh, cap layer to serve as the base layer for my head. So yes, you can even layer your head if you want to. A lot of times when I'm hiking, I'll end up ripping off my thick hat after about 15 minutes because my brow and my head will just start sweating and overheating too much. This smart wool cap is even thinner than my glove liner and allows my sweat to evaporate and wick much better. But it's not so great at keeping my ears warm. So third down the list of frozen and numb extremities that I hate the most are my hands first, my feet second, and my ears third. And to avoid that, I simply added a buff like a headband over my ears and that did the trick. My head was not sweating too much and I was not too cold either. I think in the future, I'm gonna ditch my thick hat and just use the lighter cap and buff combination to make a hat. Like I said earlier, I also have a polar buff that I use around my neck and also to go ninja mode. Um, I think the only time I went ninja mode was on max patch when the winds were going 30 to 40 mile an hour and the wind chill was pretty bad. So I just pretty much lifted the buff part up over my nose like this and I was nice and warm. One quick tip about buffs is that I could have used the buff itself as a hat by tying it into the 15 different ways that you can tie a buff. But I'm way too lazy to learn those 15 different ways, so I usually just use buffs in tube mode. If I get colder, or if I want more warmth, then I'll simply just pull my shirt hood up over my head like so. And if I get colder than that, then I'll pull up my outer shell hood over my shirt hood. Voila. And I'd probably use the cinches on my outer shell to cinch it around my face to make sure everything stays in place and doesn't fall into my eyes. But those are some tips about hats. And next we'll talk about bottom layers. To start off with bottom layers are my hiking pants. They are Cull or Cool Renegade convertible pants. I own three pairs of them and after three years they show hardly any signs of wear or tear. They are as durable and strong as the day I bought them with the exception of one pair that had a small hole on a pocket which I brought to a seamstress to repair and now the pair of pants are fine again. The color is still not fading after putting them through the washer and dryer tons of times and I put them through a punishment over hundreds of miles and backpack trips and they still hold up very well. I don't see myself buying any hiking pants anytime soon or being convinced to wear anything else. One of the downsides to this pair of pants is that they're still very popular and they probably go for over $100 today when in 2019 I bought them for $80 to $90. And another downside is that these are not waterproof. They are water resistant and in a downpour they will wet out on you after about an hour or so. They aren't rain pants and they shouldn't be treated like that but they are quick drying like my base top layer and my mid layer and I never feel like I am soaked in these pants for very long. Even in cold temperatures, I only wear this one layer. My legs are the most active part of my body because I'm always using them. They are always warm because of that. If temps drop below sub 15 degrees with a wind chill, I may be tempted to throw on my thermal layer or my long johns, whatever term you wanna use, but I haven't really hiked a lot in those kind of conditions. My thighs and my lower legs simply don't get that cold and I never feel like my legs sweat a lot in these pants either and they never feel damp or wet due to perspiration when I get to camp. Another bonus in these pants is that they have generous cargo pockets and if you're anything like me I have something in every single pocket on a backpack. Another bonus are the zippers, and they are pretty high quality. They have never failed to work for me, but they are a little bit tricky to zip back on. You have to fuss with them in the morning when I'm getting ready for a hike, and it's kind of annoying. On my last day of the backpack, the temperatures got up to 50 degrees, but for the last four miles down to hot springs, it felt like 60. I could have converted to shorts, but I didn't end up doing that. Even in the summer, I rarely ever hike in shorts unless it's really hot because my legs tend to get torn up by literally everything out there. And 
It could be because of my imagination or just my opinion, but I really think that the material that these pants are made out of are tick resistant in so far as that they can't really attach to the material. I've never seen ticks on my pant legs. If I do get a tick, it's usually on my upper body. I've been bitten twice over the years and both were attached to my stomach and my arm and I've never found one crawling on my legs or on my legs or anywhere near my legs. Overall, I can't really say enough about these pants. I don't see myself again wearing any other kind of pant anytime soon. For my socks, I always go with smart wool. This is another piece of clothing I have had for forever and are seemingly indestructible. I feel like I'm never going to have to buy another pair of socks again. I own four pair that I bought back in 2019 and the only sign of wear after hundreds of miles and quite a few backpacks is a little bit of fraying there. You name it, these socks have been through it. There are no holes yet, which is just amazing after the punishment that I put these through. The pairs that I own are thick, they keep my feet warm, and they run about $20, or at least they used to when I bought them. They keep my feet nice and warm even when they're soaked, and I don't always get blisters, not to quote Dos Equis, but when I do, it's usually from hiking 15 mile days on really technical trails. And even when I do get blisters, they're really small and they're nothing serious, nothing big that doesn't heal up in a day or two. The one downside to these is that they are so thick that once they get soaked with water, they feel like they take forever to dry out inside your boot. I remember one trip in the Smokies where I got caught in a bad storm eight miles into a 16 mile hike where the trail turned into a cascade and then the cascade into a waterfall. Trees fell nearby and I had no choice but to plunge forward up the trail in ankle deep water for about a half a mile or so. Even when the rain stopped, it still felt like I had a water membrane around my foot for what felt like two hours until it finally felt normal again. At the same time, it could be a function of my boots, which at the time were Oboe's Sawtooth 2s. They were waterproof mid-hikers and probably helped trap water in my shoe. I'm currently getting used to uh, Ultras, the Zero Drop ones, the Trail Runner shoes. And if I were wearing those, my socks probably would have dried out faster or at least not retain the water for so long. I wear these socks in the summer. I don't really care if it's hot out. My primary concern is that my feet are comfortable. And on a backpack, I usually bring two pairs, one to sleep in so that my feet are nice and toasty warm at night, and one to hike in on the trail. For underwear, I've been using Saks Quest 2.0s. And these are yet another piece of clothing I've owned for years. I've owned five pairs and I'm not even going to describe the punishment I put them through over the years. They don't seem to be breaking down at all. I only really wear these for hikes long enough where I know I'm going to be encountering chafing down there. If you don't know, chafing can really ruin your day down there and I can't tell you the importance of keeping things dry. It can be really, really painful if you don't and it's a problem that exacerbates over time. Sweat wicking gear is a recurring theme in this video so far and it remains true for your underwear as well. These were a game changer for me and if you are looking for a solution for the chafing problem, these will take care of it 100%. Last up before we talk about sleeping gear are the boots. Now for my AT trip, I'll admit that I went a little bit overkill. I brought my A Solo TPS 520 GV Evos, I think is the model. I didn't know how much snow we'd run into and I went all in. These Cloud Stompers don't come cheap at $350, but they are extremely durable. For rigid, fully waterproof boots, they are the most comfortable pair I've ever tried on. I plunged these suckers into three to four inch deep water where I can't quite rock hop over the streams and the water simply doesn't get in. If I had to do it all over again, I would probably buy another pair a size or two up from what I currently have because the long downhill into hot springs was really hurting my toes. But again, I don't think I sized these correctly when I bought them and they were definitely not needed on my last trip. 
I really think that these boots are made for hard winter trips with ankle deep snow or hikes with a lot of sketchy stream crossings with rock hopping. And I can't see any snow getting into these if you paired them with gaiters. The only other issue I had with these is that in the morning my toes would go a little numb while packing up and eating and it would take a mile or two to get the blood flowing into my feet to warm up the boots because they're just so dang big and thick. As a side note, I used to own a pair of Obos Sawtooth 2s. They were extremely comfortable waterproof mid-hikers and they literally had no break-in period for me but they weren't very durable. I'd take them on most of my hikes and backpacks and I loved them. I own two pair and the first I destroyed in less than two years and the second pair I returned to REI after nine months because the rubber top part of that boot that covered my toes started peeling off. That being said, as I mentioned before, I'm trying to make the conversion to trail runners for 95% of my hiking trips and backpacking trips and I've been getting used to zero drop ultras now for the past six months on shorter hikes and recently 10 to 12 mile day hikes. I think I'll probably be doing my first section hike on the AT later in the year with uh, trail runners simply because they're light on your feet, they conform better to different types of terrain, and they dry out quickly. They also warm up faster in the morning when you're around camp and you're packing up your gear and they take like 10 to 15 minutes for your toes to warm up and uh, warm your shoe as well from what I hear. One final pro and con that I can think about about these different types of shoes is that for the boots, these things are big clod stomper and penetrable fortresses. Really rigid, really durable, meant to keep water out. And if you somehow got a ton of water into the boot, say you fall at a stream crossing, maybe you tie these boots to the back of your pack as you're crossing a stream, but one of them falls off your pack and then gets a crap load of water in there. The only way I see to dry these out is to take off the boot laces, take out the inserts, and then let some sunlight get in there to kind of dry them out a little bit. Whereas these shoes over here, these uh, are TIMP Ultra Zero Drop shoes. As soon as you step in water, you're going to feel it immediately. This is a very light mesh here. But within 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you're already going to start drying out. And I can see that being a really big benefit on warm days where you don't have a lot of rain. But on the other hand, if it were cold and it were wet and you're walking the entire day in rain and you have no opportunity to get dry, I could see that being a very uncomfortable situation in these ultras. Where on the other hand, a pro over here is that no matter how hard it's raining, there's no water going to get inside these boots. My feet are going to be nice and dry and warm the entire day no matter how hard it rains. So there's the two different types of shoes that I'm using right now. Um, I'm, I'm eventually going to switch over to trail runners like I said. And next up we'll talk about the gear that I sleep in to keep me nice and toasty warm in the middle of the night. So sleeping gear. First up is one of the most important things in my opinion. One of the first things I do when I arrive into camp and set up my tent is immediately get into my tent and switch into my thermal layer. I strip off all my damp clothes from the day and put on a nice dry warm pair of thermals, also known as long drawns. Take your pick of the terminology. I have a top and a bottom layer and mine are made out of almost 80 to 100% merino wool which is an extremely warm material. The top layer is an icebreaker brand and the bottoms are an REI brand. Thermals are like a wetsuit for your body. They hug tight against your skin and I would say that my thermals are responsible for 50% of my warmth around camp while I'm eating and also wandering around and while sleeping at night. After putting back on my damp layers, they work to keep my body heat from escaping and they will help you dry out your base layers throughout the night as well. I highly recommend getting a thin pair of thermals for sleeping and at camp 
That extra dry layer makes all the difference in the world when you're at camp trying to stay warm. Next up is one of the big ones, a sleeping quilt. I am really excited to talk about this piece of gear. I've been skeptical about quilts for a long time, but before the last trip, I decided to jump right in and buy a 10 degree enlightened equipment revelation quilt made of 800 to 850 fill power down. I got it in the long and wide size because I'm six feet tall and I move around quite a bit in my sleep. I shouldn't have doubted the hype about these quilts. It kept me toasty warm and unlike most sleeping bags where I struggled to pull the top half over my shoulders and then around my neck, I had no such issues with this quilt. I was finally able to fully cocoon myself from toes to neck and I loved not having a hood as most sleeping bags do because most times I struggled to even get my head into the hoods. The quilt is roomy, but do they give you as much room as they claim to? Yes and no. I felt I had a bit more movement room in the quilt, but it wasn't like an eye-opening amount or anything. The quilt does have a zippable and cinchable toe box about two feet long, and then the middle and head of the quilt have straps to pull and tighten the sides of the quilt under you, and also to attach to the sleeping pad so that the entire quilt is wrapped around you except for directly underneath you, which doesn't really matter anyway because that part is not exposed to let any drafts in. One con about this quilt is that the surface of it seems to collect a decent amount of condensation and when I woke up in the morning and touched the surface of it, it seemed wet to the touch. I don't remember my sleeping bags being that wet from condensation, but either way, the moisture definitely didn't seep down into my clothes and I couldn't have been warmer for the nice low of 21 degrees. By the time I was ready to throw my quilt back into the compression sack in the morning, most of that condensation had dried off my quilt and by the second night at camp, when I was ready to go to bed, it was completely dry. The second problem with the quilt was needing to buy a better compression sack than it comes with. It actually comes with a stuff sack, but it takes up quite a bit of space in my pack. And this is a small issue that was solved with the new compression sack. First impression of this quilt is a good one. It was worth the money and it kept me really warm and that's all I can ask for. The next big one is my sleeping pad. I've used the Thermarest NeoAir X-Therm now for a few years. It's never failed me. You'll read reviews from people who bought this mattress online and they'll say that they ended up popping their mattress after a couple uses or their mattress wasn't holding air at night and deflated on them. But these issues have never happened to me and I'm 200 pounds and like to toss and turn. I've used this mattress for 240 miles of the AT, the entire Foothills Trail, and several other random backpacks and it's held up to the test every single time. It has an R value of 4 plus and if I get a draft at night, it isn't because it's coming from the ground up. It has two inches of loft, which is a perfect amount for me because I'm a side sleeper and I like to get my elbow down into it for support. And I do feel I have pressure points on this mattress, but even on my own bed at home, I toss and turn in them pressure points. I can't say enough about this mattress. It's lightweight, it packs down well, the only con about it that I can think of is that it takes about 20 to 30 breaths to fill up. And if you go out with the group, other people might complain about you eating potato chips at 3 a.m. because that's exactly what it sounds like when you move around at night. And it actually sounds a lot worse than this when it's completely full. So if you don't mind pissing people off in the middle of the night from your sound and you wanna stay warm and not feel any cold from the ground, I would highly recommend this mattress. The next two items on the list I'd consider luxury items, the first of which are down pants. I have a pair of North Face Summit L3 800 fill down pants. It's like having a puffy jacket for your legs. Between my thermal layer, my hiking pants, and my down pants, my legs stay nice and warm. These are lightweight, highly compactable, and you can squish these in between anything in your pack. Just don't take these out around the fire. I accidentally put two small holes in mine from ashes and I had to patch it later. And after that, I learned my lesson only to sleep with them. Sometimes I feel like a cooling sensation around my knees, 
but it usually doesn't last long and I think it's because there's less down in the knee area on these pants than the rest of the pants. One thing I really like about these pants are the full length zippers and it's great for getting in and out of these things and not having to get into your tent. And it's got a nice deep front pocket here as well. I also think that they look really nice, but hey, what do I know um, about style anyway? I used to carry these around a lot and I got tees and my first trail name was Puffy Pants, which I dubbed myself and people seemed to like it and started calling me that. But hey, you know what? Knock me if you want, but uh, my legs were really warm at night. Um, I highly recommend these, but again, they're luxury, they're not needed, um, and they're extra weight in your pack if you care about that kind of thing. The second luxury item I like to bring on a winter trip are my Western Mountaineering 800 Fill Power Goose Down Booties. Again, you are not going to win any style awards for these because they look like big trash bags on your feet and you may get teased for them, but no one's going to see you in them because they're mainly just for sleeping inside your tent. And really the joke's on them because 15 minutes after putting these things on, my feet are warm. They weigh only 1.7 ounces, are highly compactable, and I like to squish them down in between stuff in my pack. And you can't really use these as camp shoes though because there are no treads on the bottom and it's very slippery. They are strictly for sleeping. I love these things. I can't imagine not having them on a winter trip because I don't know how I would keep my feet warm. My feet tend to go cold without them, so I highly recommend them. Next item up for sleeping gear is my RAB 750 fill power micro light down jacket. As I stated before, I rarely ever hike in my puffy coat except for in rare circumstances where I know I won't be sweating much like on flat parts of the trail that are cold. I probably wore it for three miles on the stretch of trail from Max Patch to Lemon Gap because it's pretty flat, it's downhill, and it was toward the end of the day when the temperatures were starting to drop a little bit. The key was that while I was wearing it, I didn't sweat all that much. There are a ton of puffy jacket brands out there. Take your pick, just make sure it's goose down and at least 700 to 900 fill power and you're good to go. I wear my puffy at camp all the time. I sleep in it. The amount of warmth a puffy provides cannot be understated. I feel like my thermal layer and my puffy coat are responsible for retaining 75% of my body heat while wandering around camp. I also have an 800 fill power puffy from North Face, which is a little bulkier takes up a little bit more pack space and I mainly use that one as a backup if my RAB coat gets dirty and I have to wash it or something puts this out of commission like a tear until I can repair it. I've only gotten two holes in this jacket over the years and oddly enough they were in my pockets probably from carrying something with a rough edge at home because I don't just use this jacket while backpacking. It makes a great winter coat to boot, and that's all I really have to say on puffies. Go get one. The last two items are also kind of luxury things to bring along. First up is a sleeping bag liner. I like to think of a bag liner as a thicker bed sheet. If you've ever suffered through a lukewarm summer night with the AC off in your house, you know that you can't exactly use a full bedspread because you sweat too much, but at the same time, you can't exactly sleep without any covers on because it may be a little too cold. The bag liner like this one here, the Sea to Summit Thermalite Reactor Extreme, provides about as much warmth as a thicker bed sheet in my opinion. Now, in the summer, the benefit to this is that if you were camping on a 60 to 70 degree night, this might be all you need to keep you warm and you can leave your sleeping bag or quilt at home. On the first night of my last trip, I used a bag liner, but on the second night I didn't and it was still plenty warm. I actually used it to wrap around my dog as a blanket on top of her down quilt. I think in the future I'm probably just going to give this to my dog and it'll just be hers. I think this is just something to think about and I honestly don't think it keeps you all that much warmer in the winter, but it may work for you. If you've made it this far, good. I thank you for watching this long because this is the very last item in the video and it is optional. When I got my quilt from Enlightened Equipment, I saw this hood called the Torrid Hood. It's made out of synthetic fill and since quilts don't have hoods, I thought it would be a good idea to jump in and buy one. 
Like I said before, with my sleeping bags, I can never fit my head inside them. I always struggled with doing that, so having a standalone hood separate from the bag would have been great back then. It doesn't matter how much I move around at night, I don't have to worry about where the hood is to adjust it like I did with my sleeping bags. It's always attached to my head with these three neck buttons, and it has a cinch pull cord here to pull taut around my face. It also has enough cover here on the back to reach down to the back of your neck and you can pull the quilt up around your neck to seal out drafts. I don't think you need to wear any kind of hats with this hood. It keeps my head warm enough or anything around my neck. But you are not going to win any style points for wearing this hat. It looks kind of goofy when you put it on just like the uh, puffy boots and the puffy pants. But it's so lightweight and compactable that it's worth bringing. It was an impulse buy, but it kept my head very warm. That's basically all the gear I use to keep myself warm in cold weather while hiking and sleeping. I layer my body as follows at night when I sleep. First my thermal layer, then my base layer, vest, puffy jacket, and then outer shell. For my lower body, it's thermals, then hiking pants and down pants. I don't really wear gloves while sleeping at night because my hands stay warm under my quilt. And for my feet, I wear my sleep socks and put my down booties on over the socks. Again, temperatures got down to 21 and 23 degrees with no wind. And with five top layers and three bottom layers, I feel I could have slept down to 10 degrees or less. I was that warm. With all of my puffy gear, I was just a huge, I don't know, puff daddy. That could be a new trail name for me, I don't really care. And I was so warm that I think of the Matrix quote where Morpheus is talking about humans being batteries and giving off 3000 BTUs of body heat. And if that's remotely true, then I could have sold off some of my body heat to someone or back to the power grid. It was just a dry, warm, heat and I was perfectly cozy both nights. The worst part about sleeping in the winter is waking up and having to strip off all that warmth and back to my thin hiking layers. I want to say that the gear in this video is not cheap, but what I like to tell people is that if you drop some money on quality stuff the first time, you won't have to spend money later to upgrade two or three times. Trust me on this, I speak from experience. Another note is that there's really something to be said for being out there in the winter. No bugs, hardly any ticks, bears are more scarce, no snakes, and way less people. You can also see right through the forest without all the summer foliage in the way and see some views that you wouldn't otherwise normally be able to see. In conclusion, this video is more of an informational video than a gear review, and I hope it gave you some good information and ideas about how to keep warm out there in the cold. If you liked it and would like to see more content like this, perhaps gear reviews and other gear like tents, please throw a big old hiking boot at that like and subscribe button and click the notification bell to know when new videos are uploaded. Please also don't be shy and let me know what you think about the gear in the video and I want to know what keeps you warm out there in the winter and why you backpack in the winter. Thanks for watching and I hope you live your best life out there. Who's my portable tent space heater? Are you a portable tent space heater? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. REI has nothing on you, girl. REI has nothing on you. Oh, yeah. My space heater.